All right. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 20 of On Air. Today, we are joined by Gordon Statinius. I don't know. Is that a good pronunciation, Gordon? Perfect, actually. Okay. Good. Uh, he's the founder of Candela Books and Gallery, which is the publisher of Conan Lesnick's book, 100 Views of the Drowning World. And we've already talked about it for the past month and a half. We've, um, I've done a little deep dive into it and the themes of death within it as well. Um, but, you know, we want to know more about how this came to be. Tell us a little bit more about Candela Books. Um, yeah, everything. So let's start with, um, tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you started in this business. Okay. Uh, my business, I guess, in the last nine years, almost 10 years, has been as a gallery director, owner director. Apologies for the kids now that are hopefully in the house. No. Actually. We're all very familiar. <laughs> um, but um, so 10 years or so, I've been running a gallery, and that's, I guess, where a lot of my headspace is, is uh, spent. And the books have been kind of a seasonal enterprise that have happened really one a year on average. Um, I don't think I could do much more. I don't have a staff that's dedicated to the publishing. So I employ a designer usually. And then myself, I'll have different roles within the kind of the book production, be it editor with Con and Selesnik. I actually did a lot of the layout. Uh, they were art directors effectively, as well as artists, because they really brought a really conceived really awesomely conceived book to me as a, as a dummy. And I sat there and had to kind of just price it out and think about the numbers a little bit, but I knew that I didn't have to, um, I knew one line item actually wasn't gonna be there and that was design. Um, and I actually penciled myself in as kind of somebody who could help uh, with the production aspect. In truth, I really needed to up my game a little bit. I had to learn a lot on the production side. Um, and each, each project has actually sort of been like that. I've had to learn something new uh, on the fly. Yeah, um, I love I love to say layout because the ingenious thing about this book is that the layout is playful, right? So how do you deal with a layout? How do you approach a concept like that? Uh, well, the concept, I'm not sure who else has been talking about the book or about Con Lesnick over this uh, program during the run of their show. Um, but at the risk of repeating myself, they based it on 100 Views of Edo by uh, Hirosh Hiroshiji. Hir Hiroshiji. And uh, so there was a, a precedent for this, something that they had conceived of. And the idea of having it be, you know, unbound is really also, it's, it's, it could be, you know, thrown into the air. It could be viewed as a circular work. It could be nonlinear. Um, I think the writing works as kind of a nonlinear text. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It's, it's, to me, I actually feel like, uh, you know, we, we rolled this book out, 100, 100 views, and people are kind of like, damn, way to go. And I'm kind of like, mm, thanks. But really, the artist brought the concept and allowed me to kind of um, break my own mold a little bit. I Basically, to that point, I'd been doing mostly Western Codex bound books, and I hadn't really adventured beyond that form. Um, so it was really just an opportunity. I, I kind of am an opportunist. Yeah, so is this books are concerned. is the fact that they kind of asked you to push your own boundaries and break some of the rules. Is that something you're still using now um, with the way you're developing? Sorry. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Go, you, you know, I, I, I was struggling to listen. I was getting some off camera. No, I'll repeat my question. Um, okay. So now that they asked you to kind of break your own boundaries and change the rules for yourself a little bit, is that something you're still using or in your approach to new work? Um, yeah, very likely. I think that the, uh, the book that followed theirs was uh, uh, Paul Thulin, uh, an artist who put together kind of another fantastical narrative. It is, again, another bound book, um, and it's somewhat conventional in that regard, but um, probably the most contemporarily designed book I've done. And honestly, the, the, the mechanics of it are not that... Um, economically sound, like as far as the business goes, the gallery's got a little more upside probably than the publishing. And the books are a bit of a, I don't know, a potential sinkhole. With uh, Conis Lesnick, I'll kind of digress a little bit. They are such amazing partners and they're so busy that they've actually uh, done a great job of helping me kind of like just shepherd this book into the world. Um, but for other projects, I kind of like have one eye on the notion, oh, sweetie, I, yeah, I got you, I got you. Um, 
<laughs> uh, but for the other books, I kind of have this sense that I'm just doing it really to support the exhibition programs. And Paul's was um, the second book after after Conan Selesnik's was pretty adventurous in its own right, but still it's like they're a struggle. So I'm thinking about the artist book as kind of a, it's more creative and I'm learning and I'm actually learning to kind of venture out, I think with the book as an art form, but I'm also trying to get a little cannier about like what might work from an economic perspective. Mm -hmm. Having a great partner like Conan Selesnik, that's one idea. But if it's more emerging artists, you know, maybe I want to dial back the budget and think about, um, you know, just more uh, inventive use of materials, smaller runs. Um, I'm just going to keep continuing to learn and try to flesh out my own experiences and see where that takes me. I mean, that's really exciting what you're talking about, right? This, um, the whole publishing business and the way that you can approach an art book from so many, it's, brings a whole nother curatorial perspective to how can people engage with art and how can somebody almost become their own curator. I know we've talked about this before, yeah, yeah. but yeah. you know that um, the fact that this book is unbound, people get to develop their own narratives with Conan Selesnik's work, which I think is really exciting. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, I happily took too much credit for the kind of the genius of that project. Uh, I mean, it's in, in some ways, when I say opportunist, uh, my other books too have kind of had their own little backstory and they all have a little peculiar tilt, either relationship with, that I've had for a long time or um, accidental sort of intersection or something. But uh, with these guys, it just, I just, you know, expressed kind of an appreciation for their work. Uh, I think I met them probably five or six years ago now. And, uh, and, I, and, and I was kind of marveling at this work kind of in real time when it was first kind of entering the commercial gallery market. And I just said, I love this, you know, when, when's the book coming out? Where is it coming out? Not really entertaining the notion I'd be involved in it. And, uh, and they just kind of looped me in. And I don't know, I guess maybe a couple of years later that dummy landed on my desk and I'm like, damn, you know, may I, may I do this? You know, and uh, I guess I earned a, 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 just a piece of trust or something that allowed them to kind of roll with me. I love that. So sometimes as a curator, it's important to just be the platform and that's, you know, what you did for this project and then contributed to it as well. Um, so the, I'm curious about the map, uh, since you were such a part of the layout, was the map something that you were involved with as well that ultimately created the different railroad lines and... Yeah, no, the, uh, the, the map is really something where whenever I'm... Uh, I learned early on that I can't just like hand this book to somebody like I've actually been like uh, uh, shilling my wares now in various shapes and forms for some years and if I've got a new book I hand it to you and I'm like hope you like it you sit there and you can page through it and as we stand somewhere at a bus terminal or whatever with these guys I realized that there's it's important to have like a desk or a table or something between us to kind of sort of show you what's going on how to crack it open and uh, you know that you can shuffle the unbound pages and so forth and uh, the map is like the first time I kind of get like a little bit reserved because like, I think you could teach like a, like a master's uh, sort of educational section or segment on that particular map. Oh, the intersection yes. of the characters, the time frame. Again, it came to me like wholly conceived. I didn't touch it other than to figure out how to place it on the page. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, it, it, it's, it's whimsical. Um, I find that uh, the, these, these artists are, Easy, easy to kind of put them into the camp or column of having a good time. Like they're almost having too good a time, I think. But then when you listen, <laughs> when you listen to them speak, you realize they have a ton to say. I mean, they're environmentalists, they're activists, they're intellectuals. They have a, a, a kind of a wholly rendered sort of appreciation for the history of art, all the mediums. They're not really photographers, even though that's kind of my, my, uh, I guess, specialty or my area of emphasis um and they are hard working and prolific and i mean like they earn you respect from the get-go but they kind of engage you i think with the whimsy a little bit and that map is kind of like what the hell it's just a, it's like the byproduct of just like very intelligent people i think yeah um, i never used it i mean you could use it to kind of constitute the book or reconstitute the book after it's lost its form but um other than to kind of like let it sort of wash over me, I can't really speak to the map. I didn't. I didn't create that. 
Um, so you talked a little bit about how uh, your coll collaboration started with them and the original idea. So it was already pretty fleshed out then by the time they came to you with this idea. Yeah, absolutely. And they, they put it on your desk and they're like, this, this is what we're thinking. And this is what we're thinking. I had, uh, you know, a, a couple little considerations, probably uh, ingredients I added. I changed the cover. I sort of felt like the cover they brought to me was a little more on the mask of death and morbid side in terms of just like, I think we added a kind of a beautiful sort of curb appeal to it, which is. You, perchance, can you show us, uh, Gordon? I can. The cover <laughs> as it stands. Um, I can't, uh, at, at my office, I think I may have a document of the cover that they had. It was a black and white image. It was one of the kind of, it was a masculine figure, but an Ophelia yeah. themed, uh, themed image. And so it's just, it was just a little bit heavier. Like I wondered, like when it's sitting there at a, uh, a, a retail environment, like a photo eye books or something, I was wondering like, was it poppy enough to get picked up? And I'm certain it was. These guys, they, they command a certain uh, amount of respect out in the world. So I think it would have done probably just fine. Yeah, but the I think idea they, of the color, this was, this was an alternative that they'd also considered. Yeah, I think they really just capture people's imagination with their imagery. And we want to know more about what is happening and develop our own stories, but also hear what their stories have to say. And this book is exactly what does that. Yeah. So I'm curious, what are some of the benefits and freedoms that you get in being an indie book publisher? Um, it's been kind of a, it's it, the benefits, I don't know about freedoms because it actually, it, it's, um, hasn't really worked out on some level. Like it's not like a bang up business uh, proposition generally. A few of the books have made money, but not to the extent that they subsidize the ones that haven't. You know, so I feel like I'm just trying not to lose my shirt on any given project, but I'm proud of them all the same way. Like there's there's a lot of um, pride in those books. Um, just the market has received them differently, I guess you'd say. Um, so the freedom is like, I'm still sort of burying a lot of passion into these things. And sometimes I'm still trying to get people to notice what I've done. Um, but I will say the kind of the secret benefit of it is uh, the gallery, I started a gallery uh, 10 years ago almost, um, had just done a couple of books before the gallery started. And I'd been a photographer for 20 years prior to that. So I would kind of, I knew the hustle of just trying to get work out into the world and get it shown and exhibited, sold, whatever. Um, having kind of put together an exhibition space as a, a photographer. It's not an eponymous gallery. I never really dreamed about being a gallerist, but still I didn't really have to work up from sort of the local regional into growing into like a national reputation. The books allowed me to kind of push the word out in a pretty quick and dynamic way. Um, Gita Lenz was a photographer that uh, worked with, uh, or she, I, I placed her work, I guess, with Tom Gitterman, Gitterman Gallery in New York great gallery, mid 20th century type of gallery, um, somebody who has been a real mentor to me. Followed that with Shelby Adams, who's a very known American photographer and uh, his works in 60, 70, you know, major collections. So all of a sudden like Candela was attached to these uh, viable nationally renowned artists that were being, you know, part of, I guess discussed as part of the, you know, the history of the medium. I was just riding the coattails of the books in some ways. They were like a lost leader, you might say, in an economics class, but they, uh, they helped me kind of um, burnish the name quite a bit. Um, and the freedom is I don't have to do them. There was a book I almost did for Lewis Draper. Uh, it's an African-American photographer from Richmond, a member of Kamoinge, a founding member of Kamoinge, a, a black photo collective in New York. It's... Uh, a remarkable story and I was halfway down the road of putting together that book when I learned from the estate that there's another book coming out of um, um, I guess out of community college in New Jersey where he had taught and I was like well damn I don't know that we need to push two of these out at the same time mm -hmm. and it kind of like almost broke my heart because I'd put three years of work into uh, placing that archive with the Virginia Museum and I'd put and I put um, also uh, arranged for a show up in New York of his work and like there was a lot of sweat equity into that project. And then I decided to just table that book and I don't think anybody noticed, you know, that's the freedom. Like I just, I got cold feet and decided not to do something and no one cared, you know? So 
yeah, that yeah. that that worked out in a way that you know I, I still look back in the catalog from the Virginia Museum's got like all the academic um, uh, depth that I would have been un unable to give it probably in my in my own way anyway. So did the, all the research end up in a different project, like an exhibition or anything, or is that all for, table? for Lewis Draper? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. There was a major retrospective at the Virginia Museum this past year. And so I think in January, I got to hold a, a catalog that had so much uh, depth and breadth to it that, I mean, I would have put together a monograph that would have been dignified and probably looked pretty sharp, but it would have not have added the scholarship. Um, I try to avoid, you and I had this conversation, we talked about curators. Mm -hmm. There are times where I feel like I'm wearing that, um, that mantle, but I try not to put myself out there as a scholar. I'm not, I wasn't born yesterday, I have thoughts, but I'm not, um, I don't spend my time uh, researching. I spend my time thinking about contemporary photography. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm more con connoisseurship sounds like too, like lofty, but I, I love objects. Yeah, so I find uh, interesting and leading into my next question as well. Um, do you often find that exhibition design influences book design and vice versa? And how do you play with those uh, in your own installation, especially thinking about how Kanis Lessing's book is unbound and how do you approach that in an installation? Yeah, no, uh, with them and you and I off camera had this conversation. I looked, checked out the installation shots at, at the Art Institute there and uh, there is a certain sort of visual mayhem, creative mayhem that these guys support. Even when they, even when we rolled out this book, um, they were just creating a Kickstarter for a tarot deck, which had an intense amount of work attached to it. And the thing was going bonkers. And so they could barely be bothered to focus on what this major accomplishment they just had pushed out into the world because they were getting ready to launch another one. So they were, they're kind of insane. So you just sort of try to keep up with them a little bit. Um, and I got a lot of latitude creating the show that has some similarities to yours. There was, um, there's an image in the here, I think I lifted out about six things I could pick up or refer to if I wanted to. And there's an image that's more of a Photoshop image. Um, it's a figure mm -hmm. wandering down a, uh, what, what is a shadow street in the, in the, I guess the track that accompanies it, but it has all their works, all these bill, hand bills, printed posters, original uh, paintings and whatnot. And you and I both arrived at this conclusion that you wanted to kind of do something like this alleyway, something that was frenetic and over the top and, and um, more sort of sensory or stimulation than you can really process in a, in a day. Yeah. And that alongside of this sort of ordered meticulous kind of each piece is so pristine and so um, um, unto itself kind of a unique object, I kind of try to have it both ways. And so I really did try to ride this book for its energies. Um, yeah, no, I, yeah. So I, I took, took some cues from there and I've done that before as a gallerist. Um, uh, there's other times where I've actually wasn't responsible for the book, but I've tried to capture sort of the, the sense of a project and, you know, capture that on the walls. Commercial gallery is inter it's interesting. It's not, sometimes it's, uh, there's compromises you make and you try to think about like what actually might move. Um, yeah. But we try to keep our compromises down to uh, a minimum if we can. Yeah, so I want to, uh ask one final question and hear what your favorite journey was that you've taken yourself on when you explored Conan Lesnick's book and kind of, you know, created your own narrative like I did when I only looked at the images of the death mask and read all those stories. Like, mm -hmm. what is the craziest journey you went on? Um, well, you know, I probably, if I were cracking it open on the regular now, I'd probably have to think about the pandemic and the mm -hmm. wet markets in China. And this book uh, that may or may not have been said before for your audience, but uh, I guess they, according to them, you know, and take it for a grain of salt. What do, what do the artists know about the artist's work? 
<laughs> but take it, according to them, they actually started to tell the story about the extinction of a specific species of bat due to white nose fungus, I think it's called. And so they started with these bat people, these bat human hybrids, some kind of uh, genomic sort of shift takes place where like creatures and people are sort of thrown together in this dystopian world where boundaries have washed away and the, uh, the idea of the telling of the story of the extinction of the bat, I think is what got them charged up and started, but then they decided they're more interested in the people who were telling the story of the extinction of the bat. Mm -hmm. And so they started thinking about the troop letter mouse. And they started thinking about those handbills, you know, celebrating the, the passing of a cloud or the, the celebration of, you know, the Sir Gawain and the Green Knight or whatever other literary references they riff on. And so they wind up with this kind of, uh, disjointed narrative that's you know very rich in texture and whatnot but it all comes from this like this uncomfortable dystopian future and the environmentalism and so so now like I think it's just a really prescient book um prior to now prior to being the pandemic in day 76 like locked in the house <laughs> with a three and a six-year-old yes. um I was more drawn to like just almost like a more of a tarot sort of vibe where I'd pick up an image that I appreciated because there's so many images that I love in here. The project has my respect, but then there's like, you know, 25 images that I just will, will just stare at or return to. And so I tend to read those just one offs every once in a while. I haven't treated it like a like a collection of stories in a long time. Uh, when we first put it together, I gave it a, like a, a workman like read a couple of times, but um, more now, I just pick up one story, you know, yeah. whenever I bump um, into it. That makes a lot of sense, though, because each story has so much to unpack, so many different thoughts and ideas to just explore and concepts that they've used and theories and all of that. So it makes sense to approach them one at a time. And it's also fun to time together. So, yeah, I would recommend to everybody to take a look at Kanan Lesnick's book, 100 Views of the Drowning World. It's really Quite an incredible journey it takes you on then gordon i want to thank you so oh did you want to say i was just gonna say it's yeah. sort of along the same lines of a closing sort of thought one of the, one of the things that uh is really uh spot on about this book and i saw it as a kind of a um uh, i don't know an opportunity from the get-go was you can't pick up this book and digest it so many other monographs so many other photo books you can kind of like spend 20 minutes with it and get front cover to back cover and kind of get the entirety of it. The writing and the, the, the fact that some of you can tell some of these shoots are like the, the production value of a certain shoot must have taken a week to get the art direction, costuming, the styling, all that stuff is so over the, over the top. And then you add to the fact there's so much text, you just can't get this in a sitting. And so I knew that I was putting together something with their help, with their actually the essence of them in it, that you just, I mean, it just demands a lot of attention. It really does. And I think that makes it more exciting because you get to emerge, emerge yourself for a longer time into this absurd world, right? And yeah, yes. I really like that. Um, Gordon, thank you so much for taking the time today to talk yeah. and tell thank us more you. about the book and the creation of it. And thank you too, it's a pleasure. Yeah, and take care and enjoy your kids. I <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, bye everybody. We'll see you next week for uh, our on their episode for our season 14 announcement, which uh, is really, really exciting. I'm really excited to let you guys all know who we have coming next season. So, all right, bye. <laughs>